Hey, everybody. It is the Coffee with the Geek program. It is the fall of 2023. With me, as always, is a great guest, this time coming from the great state of Wisconsin, a state I haven't traveled to, but I hear it's very similar to New York in a lot of uh, climate and uh, culture. So we'll have to get out there one of these days. But Tony Spence is my guest, and he is the superintendent of the Waterford Graded School District. And he started in July of 2022. And before that, you were the chief information officer at Muskego Norway School. I love the names out in Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a trivia just to be able to announce everything. Yeah. So you were out at that school district uh, in Muskego, Wisconsin. So uh, Tony, welcome. Really great to have you join me today. And if I could, let's start with the easiest question of them all. Do you have a favorite coffee blend or do you have another drink of choice? Yeah, actually, uh, so I'm not an actual coffee drinker. Not that that should be a bad thing. My father was definitely a coffee junkie. So <laughs> but I actually went more in the direction of tea. So Tevana had the pineapple Kona. And so it was really hard to get a hold of more recently. So I bought really large containers of it. So I have my steeper. So when it comes to a nice warm beverage, I go the tea route and it's perfect for what I need. Maybe a little extra honey in there as well. So it's a nice combination. So definitely hits the spot. Yeah, it's funny how people, if you're a tea drinker, you pretty much stay away from coffee. And if you're a coffee drinker, you stay away from tea. It's kind of funny <laughs> right. how that breaks out like that. Yes, I guess. exactly. You can't have too much, uh, or you can have too much caffeine, I suppose. But so Tony, let's kind of dig into your background. And what I love to always talk about is what was your educational journey? And I, I love this question because it really kind of, first of all, a lot of teachers maybe hadn't started off thinking they were educators or teachers or even superintendents. Uh, so it's, it's often fun, I think, to kind of see how people came to their place in education. So if you could kind of walk me through your journey. Yeah, thank you. Well, I actually started off wanting to be a postal worker so I could always deliver deliver the mail to my parents. <laughs> As a result, I always thought that would be great. Um, uh, that quickly morphed into becoming an educator. My father was in education. Many members of my family were in education. So in part, it was the family business, if you can call it that. But to what extent and to what type of impact was a little bit different. Uh, I always had an interest in the areas of technology. It was at a very young age. It just became, it, it was like part of the the fabric of what I did, but I always found particular interest in figuring out new ways to do things. And I thought that was just kind of the appropriate route of innovation slash education. So I actually had the opportunity when I was in my undergrad to seek out a minor to go with my education major. And they said, well, science or math seem to be the particular areas of interest. And I said, I'd actually like to go into computer science. And I was told, well, those two things don't connect. Uh, they're different worlds. And so it was a lot of ongoing conversation that where I was eventually approved to have a computer information systems minor to go with my education major. And then that paved the way for all the way until graduation. Then I had a decision to make, do I go into computers? Do I go into education? And so I picked the education route. I felt it was exactly what I needed to do. Spent eight years in the classroom as both a fourth grade teacher in the Elmbrook School District and another year in the middle school at Wisconsin Hills Middle School doing a wide variety of different type of instruction delivery. And that was my last year in the classroom before I went into uh, my first role as the director of technology. So I actually got to fuse both the education world and the computer world together in that role. And it's been the best thing for me ever since, which of course led into, as you had mentioned, my chief information officer role with Muskego and then now here as superintendent. But you never kind of take away from the technology. In other words, I feel like whatever role I do, the technology is kind of built into the fabric of that piece. But I've always been, I guess, what I consider to be an educator, lifelong learner it's, as well, but also feel like my path has not been random and it's been very intentional. So my interest in, in technology, I've just been very lucky that the jobs I've had over time, has, there's always been a high demand for that and then opportunity as well. So again, very lucky to be here, but thankful for the opportunities that have been provided to me as well. So you, let me kind of reframe that. You said you thought they were random or they seem to kind of flow. They weren't random. Yeah. The the fact is um, I feel like I was kind of the skill sets that I have and the interests that I have were very much around teaching others and sharing knowledge with others. But then also in the area of technology, 
and computers. And I think there was a really good portion of my time in my life where those were not considered to be together. Mm -hmm. Technology was the brave new world. What are we doing with this? What are we, how are we wrapping our arms around it? It was, we had the computer lab and in isolation that you have a computer lab. That's what it is. You need to type things up and print it off. And this is how you do it. And then I think what happened was, again, convincing the Dean of the School of Education at my educational institution at university level was a massive change for me. And because of that, it was that forced <laughs> entry in a way, that persistence, that going after it and seizing it, that it really established that this truly is what I wanted to do. And then fortunately, I didn't really have to decide. Yes, I went into education and not computers, but then a good portion of my life had been spent administratively supporting uh -huh. very much both of those things. So I think there was a chance that my pathway couldn't have gone that way if I wouldn't have been able to get that approval. But now right. I truly have the degrees, the education, my master's degree was in or technology as well. And it's just been kind of what I've done ever since. So, Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you you reframe that because I, I think my path was similar. And I think a lot of educators are, as, as I kind of mentioned, it's always fun to kind of see how they went. And it, it's almost... A colleague and I always used to say, you have to kind of ride the wave, right? You'll, you'll see this new wave coming. It's like, let's take it, you know, because it's going to go in a, right. in a fun new direction. And it almost feels like that. It almost, it, it, it's random in its sense, but it's also very predictable and you can kind of see it coming and it just feels right to take it, you know? Well, my teams would always say, and they got tired of me saying it, our practices from three years ago would not apply today. And that is, I think, how we show that we're growing with the needs of a system. A lot of it was predicated on technology, but just not that alone. Uh, it was the fact that, again, we can't do that old intentional practices that we had then and apply them now because they just wouldn't apply. That's how quickly things change. And I think it's that mindset that change is inevitable. The innovation will help us and that we can kind of work together on that rather than a who moved my cheese. I'm going to sit here as a point of stasis. Right. The only thing. It just doesn't work. So, well, and that really tailors into my next question, which is, you know, as a superintendent, what are your successes with educational technology initiatives and what are your challenges? Yeah, I think the, the fact that you come in new to an organization and there's a lot of organizational learning and it's really understanding what those needs are, what's working well, what's not. And then I have a good friend that would repeatedly say, being right is not a strategy. In other words, having solutions by themselves isn't enough. Understanding what solutions could be isn't enough. It's understanding when and where and how those may apply to the organization. And also, is the organization ready to accept that type of change? So I feel like you have to figure those things out first. Because what can happen is you can apply a new technology or something related to that technology, and it may fail, not because it was implemented poorly, not because the technology wasn't awesome. It was because the system wasn't ready to receive it just yet. And so I think for me, it was trying to figure out what some of those needs are, what we were ripe for, what we were not, what did we have to hold on? And then also from a standpoint of, of just cost. I mean, technology costs, those things, you know, they just really haven't gone down. And we've gone from really a you buy it and you own it to more of the software model of you have to continue to pay for certain costs and fees. It's understandable, but it's also trying to figure out how can we build that into our budget long-term. We're always aware of that mindset. Once you've purchased it, you're good for a certain cycle. And now we have to account for other those maintenance type items as well. So I do think that our institution, we have to figure out not only what our needs were, what our budgetary items were, how does that fit with the strategic plan, which sounds a little boring, but the strategic plan is written around the whole design of the district needs. And then also, I, ideally, that everything could pop up in an instant that we have all these needs. Do we have the uh, system capacity in terms of all of our staffing and all of our people and system knowledge to be able to move these things forward? So it's been, again, I would say kind of an audit of the system initially, but then we've had some really great success. Uh, we just started summer school just a few years ago, and that might seem like not a big deal, but post-COVID, that was a massive thing for us. And so our institution really benefited from that, but also uh, there were so many different ways that the technology could kind of allow a little more flexibility and freedom within that. Also, our organization did not have what I consider to be an active engagement process. 
So I use tools like Qualtrics to kind of grow and build um, a survey utility, as well as an evaluative utility, looking at things like sentiment score, looking at things like growth over time. What are our goals when it comes to looking at trust in leadership? Um, uh, we'll call it salary and benefits, how people are satisfied with that. Assessing and doing all these things. Well, it wasn't just me saying a general raise of hands or simply putting it into a basic form. We have data down to very individual level, but it was also confidential and also anonymous. Those things take a lot of time, but again, feeds into our strategic plan. Ultimately, the technologies are endless, but our classrooms are where we're really excited. You know, we have the opportunity to say, we still need interactivity. We still need the opportunity for staff, no matter what level you are, to be able to have the opportunity to present. We don't want Sage on the stage, but we still need something bright. We still need something large. So that's inserting basically things like the Epson projection systems. Most people are going to panels and I would say, well, we've been able to say that a hundred inch screen that's super resilient, that has the ability to be on with very bright light and all these other things means that no matter what classroom you're in, you have that interactivity. And now you have a great technology that's reliable, easy to use, et cetera. So it's finding a way to have universal technology across the system. Definitely still a work in progress, but the big step was to identify what we wanted, what we needed, did it fit for every single classroom? So whether it be hardware, whether it be software, whether it be systems to support things like summer school, there's obviously been some pretty major change, but I would say we've got a plan for five years out. There's so many things on the road ahead and actually just finished up a conversation not that long ago where I'd say there's about 25 different line items just within one system by itself. So it's not only growing and adding more to the system, it's better utilizing what we do, even with what we have currently, and also that ongoing training. We have some really exciting things happening in the classroom every day, and I think our teachers feel very well supported, but ultimately it's having to make sure that we're staying on top of that technology as well for them. Well, that transitions nicely to my next question. I don't know if you're doing this on purpose, but... Um, <laughs> What are your, your predictions, you know, put on your, or take out your crystal ball and say like, what are your predictions in the future of educational technology? And it could be, where do you want to see it? Where do you think it's going to go? You know, of course, everyone, you know, it, it actually has kind of died down. I think a little bit, the AI, you know, explosion that happened at the end of last year. And now everyone's kind of like, well, what exactly does that look like in school? Uh, but again, that we don't have to go that direction. Um, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of interested in where VR is going to go, if that's ever going to get to education, or maybe it's, anyways, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think there's a lot that can be done for the student at regardless of what age, because I think we often go to high school or upper middle school, where we think the autonomous learning piece and agency and what's being learned happens more so at that level, but I've observed it at the kindergarten level where students come into the classroom, they're not being told, all right, everybody quiet down, get everything out and get prepared for the day and what's learning ahead. There's this quiet entry. There is access to a device. There's input. There's checking in on whether or not there might be feedback from a parent or even from a teacher on something. There's maybe even some updates that go to the teacher that are being done right away the efficiency of instruction happens because right away, those kids are in a, in a mode of learning. And it doesn't mean they're right out of the gate doing something super high level, they could be. It means that they're actually actively engaged from the get-go. Now, it doesn't mean technology is the only way that happens, but it is a big part of it. And they're not on technology all day long, but they see it as a fabric. Again, this is what we do routinely. So the routines are built in. And when you realize that can be done at the kindergarten level, it certainly raises the bar all the way up from there. And it's pretty exciting because again, the utilities that come I mean that we're getting feedback from parents where they're not always keyed into what's happening day to day with their kids. They get some summary, they pick them up after school. How was school today? They might have a student led parent teacher conference or a student parent teacher conference where this is great feedback, but they're like, wow, I never realized this was the level of, of what's happening. And now the kids also have a higher expectation of their parents. They bring something home. The parents would say, wow, that's really nice. And then all of a sudden the child says, well, what do you think is nice about it? <laughs> and now we're actually expecting some more level of feedback. It's not just 
I keep having this uh, information that comes home, but I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. We think about if that's the baseline, then there really is no limit. If that can happen at the kindergarten level, then there is no limit. And so what I think about is, whether it be VR or augmented reality, I feel like this can allow us to experience something no matter where we are, there's no limit. It doesn't create a have and have not. I've traveled to Europe, I've traveled to all these countries, and if you haven't, you can't experience that with me. Well, that's not exactly true. Or I, I no longer have to feel like that my background or my community or my exposure that I'm limited. And I feel like we finally started to equalize access to things like technology so that it doesn't create as much separation. It used to be like whether you have a device or whether you don't have a device. But once you're on a device, then hopefully it is that I now have access to all of what my peers have access to. And so it's kind of an equalizer that way too. So I feel like the future is that we continue to make sure that no matter what student is in wh whatever classroom they are, whatever district they are across the country, across the world, that they're not limited, that their access to things expands. The other part I would say is I actually was able to do a presentation on AI. I was at a workforce conference and uh, two days before the conference, I emailed the, the hosts and I said, I'm going to change my topic. And they said, well, you're, you're presenting in two days. I don't know if that's a great idea. Well, I found a thing called gamma.app and it's an AI and it says, yeah, we'll write a presentation for you. So I'd been sitting in the parking lot while the family was shopping, adding a few notes on my phone, thinking, I think this is going to be my new topic. I added that to um, this thing called gamma.app. And an hour and a half later, I had not only created a full presentation, all my details, all my specificity. So I presented at this conference with that. I stepped through all these different things about debunking myths, about certain generations being lazy, all those things. Had all these pictures, had all these magazine articles, all these statistics. At the very end, I said, well, if this presentation has been helpful for you, I want you to know I didn't write it. <laughs> Mic drop, right? That this yeah. is the reality of that. Because I think the emphasis of AI is I didn't cheat on that presentation. I didn't take credit for the work, but I had ideas. And I was able to bring those to life quickly and easily in a very presentable manner in a much shorter period of time. A very good coworker of mine took 10 hours to create her presentation. And it's not because she's less capable. She was very thorough. I was an hour and a half. She was 10 hours. So you start to talk about what the differences are, is that we have similar outcomes, but I've used tools to get me there a little faster. And I think the AI piece is, in, is inescapable in a way, but we can't fear it. Similar to like when my math teacher said, you're never going to have a calculator on you. Yes, you will. Internet was, boy, internet is going to be a fad. It's going to go away. No, it's not. AI is how do we understand it and deal with it rather than say it's just bad and then run away from it. Mm -hmm. And I think it is understanding better ways to harness it. So I'm not goo goo gaga for AI, but I certainly appreciate and understand the utility of it. And I think it's going to continue to do a lot more for us. That being said, um, if I were to ask what kind of technologies would be I still think there needs to be growth in the access to internet anywhere you go. I, it feels like we're almost there, but we're really not there. All these broadband initiatives are very important, but I actually don't know if we truly have high-speed internet options for all families and all places at all times. And some might say, yeah, that's good because I don't want screen time all the time. I'd say that's not it. It's that when I need it, I'm able to get it and do those things. So I feel like it's a physical feature and function that could be our most important continued innovation, even more so than just the hardware, the software. Nicely answered. All right. Um, well, let's maybe we'll stick to this one uh, last question here before we get to the speed geek questions, which can yeah. be fast and, and fast, but so maybe let's keep this one straightforward. What would be your advice for young superintendents? What's a piece of advice you'd give them? Yeah, the, the focus of what you do is your community, it's your board, it's all policy, it's all that stuff. And, and there's going to be a lot of that demand, okay? There's going to be a ton of it. In fact, you might feel that that alone could be your entire job. But if you're not in the classrooms, 
If you're not observing the things that happen day to day with your students, with your staff, uh, then you're really not what I consider to be doing the full job. Okay. All those things will pull you away. You could work endlessly 100, 150 hours a week, even if that's not possible. And yet ultimately your key time, even if it's a small percentage of time, has to be in those educational spaces. You're honoring your educators. You're honoring those that aren't even educators in the classroom. It could be your operations people, everyone else. You need to be connected with them because what they perceive you're doing may not be what you're actually doing. And that doesn't have much value unless they know they're having a connection with you. And it doesn't mean that everybody wants to see you every single hour of every day. It just means you need to be in those spaces. In fact, I would say it could be one of the most critical pieces to success of the role, particularly early on and even into the future that people feel connected to what you're doing. And so as you start to roll out things or start to think about change in an organization, you need to have that capital you need to have those opportunities and those relationships with people within the organization. Otherwise, um, I don't think that buy-in is going to be there. And so establishing that and being present echoes an eternity for change within the organization, but it starts there. I like that. All right, well done. Um, so let's dig into some speed geek questions. So these are kind of light, lively and okay. uh, to the point. And we'll start sure. with uh, this first one, what's your whimsy? Star Wars, Star Trek, or Harry Potter? Yeah, I'm definitely a Star Wars person. And <laughs> not because I've ever disliked it. In fact, I didn't have cable growing up. I, and so Star Trek was on after school. So <laughs> yeah. I spent my time. But I do love the Star Wars piece. And I've geeked out ever since. Uh, even my own children are into it as well, which is very nice. I yeah. always had Harry Potter to my class when I was a teacher, but still Star Wars at the core. I did too, yeah. Yeah, I saw the original three Star Wars in the theaters, and that was a special experience back in the yes. day. Yes, incredible. And uh, I was talking to someone yesterday about uh, Harry Potter as well. And as a teacher, Harry Potter broke into the, into the gosh, the culture. And uh, I, I don't know that we'll ever see a kid's book like that transform, right. you know, society the way that one did it just uh you know adults were couldn't wait till the next book came out kids couldn't wait till the next book out and then you had the movies that were also i think were pretty high quality and well it's thematically <laughs> simple when we think about it whether we think of something like smallville and superman yeah think about uh luke skywalker we think about harry potter they all had a myth and legend beyond where they came from Sure. Yeah. It wasn't clear. And so I feel like people find that to be relatable in a way that there's this unknown capacity for something and then cheer it on because they're often the underdog in many yeah. situations and then show great power. And I think everybody loves that story. So there's commonality, but still I'll, I'll give the nod to Star Wars. So, yep. All right. Uh, what's your favorite app? Yeah. You know, <laughs> as of late, um, I actually have needed this app. So I've been on Waze, which is the one that's simply a navigation app. Sure. Yeah. But this has spared me a few um, citations, I guess. You'd say. Okay. So being a little short on time and, and having to travel so quickly between certain spaces. Yes, within reason. But uh, I feel like being able to provide both um, warnings on the roadways and a few other things too. And I go, I know it's a very basic one, but I use it literally every day. And I know it wow. has saved me a, a few dimes, if I can just say that. So, Great. Yeah. All right. And we'll go with your last one. Let's make this something fun. Uh, what was your first storage device? Yeah. So, you know, thinking of that, there were, there were the floppy disks and all those things and certainly had those. Um, the five and a quarter uh, was always that one, but I never considered that storage because it was almost like you couldn't put much on it. Uh, but yeah. one thing I was really excited about was having a PCMCIA based CD burner and the ability to store up to 650 megabytes, I think was the max on the yeah. CD at the time. And yes, that ages me, but I had a, an old Sager Mittern German made laptop with the PCMCIA port, which I was able to load. Now I had to work on high mem and autoexec.bat and change some of the loads to be able to run this within my Windows 311 for work groups environment, eventually wow. Windows 95, and then make the burns and start actually storing pretty significant amounts of data. And then it wasn't susceptible to like zip drives and the clicking death. And I don't know if people will really relate to that or not, but it used to be that if you didn't eject properly on a 250 megs uh, zip drive, 
and you did it through the software and not through the physical, you could actually have a problem where it would create a clicking death and everything would be erased. And I thought, I don't want to be there. <laughs> so I started getting in the habit of like, when I wanted to mass store, I'd literally burn it on a CD disc. So maybe very unconventional, but it, it certainly worked for those times. I know. It's, it's fun to go down that memory lane. And really, storage has been all, so much about you know technology and what's driven it. And now with cloud storage, it's a whole different you know ball game in and of itself. It makes know? local storage very irrelevant, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. All right, well, we'll stop there, Tony. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a great, really, conversation. A lot of big ideas. I like it. And uh, good luck in your uh, superintendency. It seems like you're just getting rolling and a lot of good initiatives. So uh, let's keep in touch and thank you. Andy, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.